up next, the Metro Council votes tomorrow on the Oilers coming to Nashville. All federal employees go back to work, their jobs are anything but secure. 1995 in Tennessee, a more innocent time. The state was excited to potentially welcome an NFL football franchise in the Houston, later Tennessee Oilers. The Atlanta Braves would go on to win the 1995 World Series. This was a time that people routinely, even in town, didn't lock their doors. But in March of 1995, the small town of Pulaski, Tennessee, would experience fear unlike anything the town had before, seemingly. And maybe a few more doors would lock. This is a story that has never really been told because nobody has really had a desire to tell it. It's a tale of mental illness, undiagnosed and improperly managed. It's a tale of murder. It's a tale of pain. The story of the 1995 chainsaw killing of Pulaski, Tennessee. I was 14, and I still remember the feeling that swept across this city then. To tell our story properly, we have to take a step back and think about where mental health was in the early to mid 90s. In many ways, it's how it is today. But we have to understand how we got here. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy signed the Mental Health Centers Act. It was his last act that he would sign while in office. This would take federal money and put it into the individual states so that they could build centers of care to combat specific mental illness. At this time, some 500,000 Americans were in long-term mental facilities. And the thought at the time was many were essentially put in and they never came out. In the 70s, we would have things like the Willowbrook scandal where Geraldo Rivera would show the horrible, decrepit state that many of those in long-term healthcare facilities faced. As the 70s gave way to the 80s, the Carter and Reagan administrations, although not in agreement on much, were in agreement on mental health, a mental health bill that had been signed into law by President Carter and further enacted by President Reagan would set aside vast amounts of money for simply the promotion of positive mental health. And although gains had been made, especially in the area of schizophrenia, for example, many people that had been properly diagnosed with schizophrenia and properly medicated had been able to have families, hold down jobs, things that some 20 years before would have been almost unheard of. But just two months into President Reagan's administration, he was shot by John Hinckley Jr., himself a schizophrenic who had not been properly diagnosed and not been medicated. As with anything, there's always a monetary component as well. By the 1980s, the monetary output to combat mental illness in the United States sat at $20 billion, the third largest medical expenditure in the entire country. In the attempt to combat the long-term institutionalizing of a large swath of the American public that was growing exponentially decade after decade, what President Kennedy's program had instead done is close down a great many large-scale facilities and place the power in more in halfway houses, in smaller group settings, sometimes at home. But oftentimes, no treatment was happening at all. 
with large-scale facilities closing, 90% of the beds that had normally been allocated to mental health were no longer there. And by today, in 44 of our 50 U.S. states, the number one caretaker for the mentally ill is the prison. On March the 12th of 1995, police would get an urgent 911 call requesting that they come to the home of one Thomas Red McCluskey of South 5th Street in Pulaski. McCluskey, who was 39 years of age at the time, had been known as somebody that you just don't mess with. Uh, the reputations of him in town were that he had messed with drugs in his youth and was never quite the same after that. He also had a bit of a reputation as a fighter and his altercations at the Dew Drop Inn in the 1980s were fairly well known around town. I remember that incident at the bar. <sighs> Started over a girl he was dating, I think. Still, no one in their right mind takes a gun into a bar and doesn't expect trouble. I just don't think Red was the monster people made him out to be. The Lord knows there's plenty of reasons to call him that. The fact is, he had gotten off his meds before. Twice while I worked for the ambulance service. He went into the dewdrop inn and threatened people in there and was beaten up pretty badly and left in the Goodyear parking lot. A year later, he caught a ride by jumping in front of a car. I think it was a van, I remember, a woman driving down by the airport. He also jumped on a friend's car. He used to taunt him. I told that person not to, but he didn't listen. He is on this site, so you know who you are. Although as the years went by, Thomas Red began to have the reputation as the local boogeyman of sorts, his brushes with the actual law were minimal. 1978, a charge of trying to purchase illegal ammunition. It was dismissed. 1984, a light charge of owning a sawed-off shotgun. The weapon was confiscated and nothing more happened. Diagnosed as a schizophrenic, rarely would Thomas Red actually seek treatment. This would come back later as officials, both in the private sector and the public sector, were scrutinized for not doing more to prevent what would happen. Many friends remember very positive interactions with Thomas, especially in his youth. But by the 90s, he was also known as that man who would just wander the streets in your local town. Or people would see him at his work at the Pulaski Lumber Company. Yeah, I remember him from Pulaski Lumber Company, where my dad worked. He worked in the cement block house with Bo Bowen. They called him Thomas Red, and he used to walk around my car staring at me when I would go down there to carry Daddy some lunch or go to pick up money to pay one of his bills. He would actually press his face against the windows. My mom knew him and said he had problems and to ignore him. My dad told me not to open my windows when he walked up and to lock the doors. He didn't trust him at all. On the morning of March 12th, 1995, just after 10.30 a.m., Bo Bowen, the brother-in-law of Thomas Red McCluskey and Bowen's son, Jason, had went to the home to check on McCluskey. They both went to opposite sides of the house. Bo Bowen, upon hearing a chainsaw, saw his son running for his life. Thomas McCluskey had done the unthinkable. He had slashed his nephew from his shoulder to his back. Bo Bowen tried to catch up and save his son, Jason. But before he could, Thomas Red would deliver a decisive blow, a death blow, nearly decapitating Jason Bowen. Jason had tried to make it down the street, his blood covering a large area. So much blood, in fact, a fire engine had to be brought in to hose down the area. Bo Bowen would rush to a neighbor's house and make the 911 call. McCluskey would simply return to his front yard as if nothing had happened. 
Dr. John White, Ph.D. and former lieutenant with the police department in Pulaski, would make the following remarks to the Tennessean when he came upon the scene. I've always heard people say, if we don't get things in hand, our streets will run red with blood. When I saw the water washing down the street, that's what I thought of today. Lieutenant White would hear from the officers at the scene how McCluskey was just sitting in his front yard as if nothing had happened, not a care in the world. That's where he was when the officers arrived. Then he went back to the body and stood there. Word had spread very quickly of this grisly attack through the small town of Pulaski. There were people who had witnessed it. There were nearly 100 spectators on the site as the body was taken away. The crime would grip the state. Initially, McCluskey would not cooperate with police. But after being assured by a judge that he would not have to take his medication, he said that he had indeed killed the boy. And it could even possibly be over a debt of $5. Most of the family members of Thomas Red McCluskey who were interviewed by both local and national news said they were not surprised by this act of violence. Even his own sister, Helen, whose son, Jason, he had killed. When he was off his medication, he was violent, always threatening family and friends with weapons. He would talk about murdering animals. He was a different person when he wasn't on his medication. McCluskey's sister, Helen, said she had begged for years for police, for hospital personnel to please get the help that he needed. Please institutionalize him. And unfortunately, because of the change in laws, they could not hold someone against their will. And for the most part, Thomas Red McCluskey was holding down a normal life. He was working a job. He had a home. He paid his bills. But simmering underneath the surface was a demon that if not properly medicated, was going to hurt someone. And he did. The sad fact is there are a lot of people out there not capable of living in a free society, but we cannot commit them against their will. People don't understand the last two decades have changed, and mentally ill people can't be institutionalized the way they used to be. Thomas Red's court-appointed attorney, Sheriff Flacey's first line of business would be very clear to establish if he was competent or not for trial. Unsurprisingly, the official determination would be that he was not competent. Assistant District Attorney Richard Dunavant would comment, I thought he had in mind that if he didn't cooperate with doctors and his lawyer, that maybe the case would just go away. They were having a hard time getting through to Thomas Redd, helping him understand the complexity, helping him understand the heinous the evil act that he had done. McCluskey's lawyer would enter in a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. There would be moves to various jails because of problems that Thomas Redd was having being incarcerated, although those would never be really elaborated on. And this story that had gripped the nation for a time, certainly gripped the state, the story started to be few and far between as the case dragged out well over a year. Finally, in 1996, prosecutors would discuss the case and the fact that they were willing to accept not guilty by reason of insanity if he would be remanded to the state mental hospital. Authorities has assured the public this would not be a situation where he would one day walk the streets free. And in fact, he would stay in a state hospital for the rest of his life. Over the course of a year, Thomas Red McCluskey would be moved from local jail to county prison, then maximum security prison at Riverbend in Nashville, Tennessee. Finally, upon the verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, he would be remanded to the Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute, where he would spend the rest of his life. Not much is known 
about Thomas McCluskey during this time? No, Thomas did not ever marry. He died at a mental hospital in Nashville about a year ago. Lord knows Jason did not deserve to die and go through what he did. Worst part of it was Thomas loved that child as if he was his own rather than a nephew. There is a huge gap of time in the life of Thomas Red McCluskey that we know nothing about. We do know that on June the 18th of 2010, at the age of approximately 55, Thomas Red McCluskey died, most likely in the Middle Tennessee Institute of Mental Health. We have no idea where he's buried. Jason Bowen, who was only 20 years of age when he was killed by his uncle in such a horrific way, lived on Stadium Street in Pulaski, Tennessee. He would be buried not even a mile away in the Maplewood Cemetery. And just a few years later, his father, Bo, would join him. To this very day, when you are talking with people that knew Thomas McCluskey, you will have just as many to take up for him, not justify what he did, but to take up for the person that he was when he was in his right frame of mind as those that brand him a devil. It made the town re-examine its own mental health how we treat those with mental handicaps in our country. What changes need to be made at the local and federal levels to properly protect the public? I would love to say that between 1995 and now, we've figured those things out. We haven't. We see the instances of gun violence. We see horrible murders that take place, and we know that we haven't figured it out, that there will be more situations, maybe not quite like this, but more senseless violence will happen. But ultimately, the question in this case is a question that we still struggle with now. Can you force a person to take care of their mental health? There's also something very curious that Thomas said when questioned by police. Yeah, I killed that boy. I had good reason. Happy Halloween, everyone. And keep safe.